Hey, 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 and welcome back. We're going to be talking in further depth about these five rules of ERC-4337. So we mentioned in the last video what these five rules are, and I want to talk about them in more detail, taking a look underneath the hood at what is happening here. So we have our user and the bundler, which as I talked about are the two keys. The user's key is going to be an authentication key that is going to be verified in the smart contract account. So we can introduce other types of cryptography that can then be used to verify that this user is allowed to use the smart contract account. We have the bundler and the user are going to be our two keys. And then we have three smart contracts, the entry point, the paymaster, and the smart contract account. Now, this whole setup is pretty complicated. And I mentioned that the whole reason we're doing this is to be able to enable this smart contract account to be able to be used as if it were just an account initiating a transaction, right? So a lot of the things that we're going to be looking at in these slides feels a little bit meta, right? Because it's all about setting up for this smart contract account to seem like it is initiating a transaction. In this case, we're going to be talking about that transaction as a user operation, which you can think of as a meta transaction. It is a thing that the smart contract account is trying to do. So we're really going to get up to that point where the smart contract account can start making state changes on the EVM, just like an EOA would in a traditional EOA flow. So let's go ahead and take a look at those flows. Okay, so let's take a look at this externally owned account flow. In a traditional user experience, we have a user who has maybe a wallet that is going to allow them to use an externally owned account where they have a private key that they are using to sign a transaction and then they submit it to a blockchain node. Now, a little bit behind the scenes here, a blockchain node is going to take that signature of the transaction and it is going to recover using something called an elliptic curve recover uh, recover the address associated to that private key mathematically. That mathematical linking between the private key and this address is what's going to allow that user to go ahead and make some state changes on behalf of that address on chain. This is what we're trying to get to in our ERC-4337 flow, where we get up to this point where we can make state changes on behalf of the smart account rather than this externally owned account. So in our ERC-4337 flow, we're going to be going over all of this in much further detail. So I don't want to get hung up on this big diagram. I do want to draw your attention to all of it because this is what we're going to get to by the end of these slides and be able to fully understand everything that's happening here. But what I want to draw your attention more closely to right now is going to be this gray box over here at the entry point. And the reason why I want to point this out is because this is what we want to enable with the rest of the ERC-4337 flow, right? This is similar to what we were just looking at for the externally owned account, where we just have an account that's trying to make some state changes on chain. It may be talking to a smart contract, in which case it's sending some call, call data through to a smart contract, maybe targeting a method, trying to make some state changes, and that contract may call many other contracts, or it may be just trying to send some ether to an address on chain. This is what we traditionally think of as a transaction, and ERC-4337 is set up to enable smart contracts contracts to be able to do just this. So let's go ahead and take a look at how all the rest of this is set up. So first, I want to talk about the relationship between the user and the bundler. So a user, and or at least for an account abstraction user, is going to sign something called a user operation. Now, user operation is like a meta transaction. It's this object that's going to look a little bit like an, a transaction, if you're familiar with the fields of a transaction, but it has a couple other things that I want to draw your attention to here. So maybe the things that you're familiar with from a transaction are things like data, which is going to be the call data eventually that the account is going to send. Uh, then we also have the nonce, which is going to be replay protection, just like it is in a transaction. We have a NIC code. This is a little bit different. This is actually going to initialize our smart contract account if it's not already initialized. And we have gas parameters, just like we do in a transaction. The two things that are very different from a transaction is we're going to specify the sender. In this case, that's going to be the smart account that's going to be sending the call data, whatever we're trying to send on chain. And then we also have the paymaster info, which is going to be specifying who might be sponsoring this transaction or this user operation, I should say, if there is a paymaster that is willing to sponsor it. So the reason why the bundler is called a bundler and not a relayer is because many users can send many signed user operations to the bundler and the bundler is going to send and sign 
all of these user operations inside of one transaction. Now, ideally for efficiency purposes, we try to fit as many user operations into one transaction as possible. So as bundlers get more and more use, as ERC-4337 becomes more and more adopted, we're going to see many user operations inside each transaction submitted by a bundler to an entry point. So the job of the bundler is going to be to collect many user operations from many AA users. It's going to be to verify those user operations. So this is actually something we're going to take a look at in a second. First thing it needs to do with those user operations is verify that they are in fact valid. If there's a paymaster specified, the paymaster should say, yes, I'm willing to sponsor that gas. If there is a smart contract account specified, which should be, uh, the smart contract account is going to verify that that user operation can be uh, sent on their behalf, right? That there's a valid signature of that user operation from the user. Then it's going to sign these user operations in a transaction, send them off to the entry point smart contract. So like I talked about, we are going to first simulate these user operations before we try to execute them. So when the bundler gets many user operations, it's going to take each one and simulate them by taking a look at what would happen if these user operations were played on chain. So it's going to go ahead and check, will the paymaster sponsor this gas if a paymaster is specified and a smart contract account? Is it, is this a valid transaction? Then once it has all of its valid user operations, it's going to submit them in the data of the transaction. Now this transaction that we're looking at in this diagram here, this one right over here, this is what you typically think of as a transaction. This is not the, meta transaction, this is the actual transaction of an EOA signing something on chain. The user operations here you can see is an array that's being specified inside of the call data that's being sent to the entry point. We're also going to be specifying a beneficiary here that's going to receive gas fees and we'll see that in a moment as well when we take a look at some user ops on chain. Now the entry point over here, what it's going to do is for each of these user operations, it's going to go ahead and verify with the smart contract account that these are valid user operations. Then it's going to ask the paymaster to do the same. Once it has those verifications in uh, check, then it can go ahead and call out to the smart contract account and say, go ahead and execute this. Smart contract will, account will do the state changes that it wants to do. And this is what we are trying to enable, right? And then finally, we do some post operation stuff. We want to make sure that the gas is paid for either by the paymaster or the smart contract account. So the entry point is going to do all of that accounting within these steps. So let's take a look at some of these real user operations on chain. I want to take a look at these inside of ArborScan and then be able to view them a little bit closer. So let's go ahead and do that. So right here we have a bundler. So this is actually a bundler on Arbitrum and you can see that there are 66,000 transactions. So this bundler has been pretty active. So what we want to do is I want to take a look at some of these different transactions and see what we can understand from them. So I'm going to pick a random one. Hopefully it's an operation that has maybe, or um, a transaction that has maybe many user operations inside of it. And we'll take a look at what's actually happening here. So this one looks like somebody's interacting with LiFi, which is uh, a, um, a DeFi protocol that could be used for bridges and swaps. We'll take a look at what's happening there a little bit closer. More, I want to take a look at more of the meta side of things, like how is that user operation getting set up? So eventually it could do the thing that the user wants to do here, which is interact with a Li-Fi protocol and one inch through that. So let's go ahead and take a look at this transaction a little bit more closely. What I like to do is I like to take these transactions into this tool here, which is a trace viewer. And what you can do is you can specify that we're going to use Arbitrum in this case and plug in the transaction hash from the transaction that we were just looking at. And what this is going to do is it's going to bring up the uh, call trace, but in a way that we can actually more easily take a look at what's happening here and start to label these different accounts. So in this call trace, the first thing that happens, the very first thing, we can sort of hide everything else. We can see the first call that is made. Now we know that the first call that's made when you're trying to make an e ERC-4337 transaction is going to be to the entry point. So this one right here, we can actually label as the entry point. Whoop, I wrote that wrong, entry point. And so now we can actually see that in certain places, entry point has been updated here and here, right? So this 
right here is actually going to be the handle ops method. Um, it's not actually being able to, sometimes this tracer is able to figure out what these different uh, methods are based on just the signature here, but sometimes it isn't. We could take this signature and look it up in something called the four byte directory. So that might be kind of nice here. If we go to four byte dot directory, we can plug in the signature and just see that indeed this is the handle ops method. And you can see what the signature looks like a little bit more closely. So we know that this is the entry point here, but we could also take a look at that by clicking on the entry point and then seeing that indeed this is a contract who has the name entry point. So awesome. We're calling out to the entry point. That's the first thing that we're going to be doing inside of this transaction. So let's take a look at this a little bit further. So once we get past that point, then this entry point is going to do, let's see how many calls. One, two, three, and four, and a log in between. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to do something called validate user up. Now validate user up, I just happen to know, is a method that's implemented on the smart account. So I can go ahead and label this as the smart account. And we could probably take a look at it and be able to verify that, although it's a little tough because most of the time these contracts are not verified. You can't see the source code, but it does look to me like a smart account, right? It has some ETH value in it. It has some tokens inside of here. So somebody's playing around with account abstraction and um, we could see that it does have some smart contract code, but we can't actually see what the source of that smart contract code is. Looks like they've done a couple transfers. So there is our smart account. It's doing a validate user op. So this is going to be that first step that we were talking about in our slides, where it is going to first just make sure that the person who signed this, the authentication, the user, is somebody who is allowed to transact on this smart account. So you can see it's doing an EC recover to take the signature of that key and be able to make sure that this is somebody who is able to transact on behalf of this smart account. Then we're going to do that second step that we talked about, which is the paymaster is going to validate the paymaster user op as well. Uh, so we can go ahead and label this one as the paymaster. And again, we might just want to check this on chain and see, is this in fact a paymaster? So we can't really tell, right? Again, because the source code isn't verified there. Um, but it does seem to me as if it would be a paymaster. It's making these deposits uh, against the entry point. So the paymaster is actually going to put um, funds into the entry point so that it can pay for the gas so that the entry point can uh, just subtract from the paymaster's funds inside of uh, the smart contract itself. So we can see that the paymaster is doing that. Uh, it's validating the user operation. Then the next thing that we have is really where it gets into the exciting stuff here, right? We have the entry point doing this inner handle operation. This is where we're actually going to get to those state changes. So if we go in here, we see smart contract execute, and it's saying here we are going to actually execute some call data against the smart contract account. This is where we're going to do all the stuff that the user actually wants to do. And you can see that it's interacting with LiFi here. And below this, we'll see all of the stuff that it's actually trying to accomplish here. Uh, probably somewhere in here, we can see that it's interacting with one inch like we saw on Arbiscan. Um, I don't see that here. I do see a Uniswap V3 swap. So you can see it's interacting with Uniswap there. So really everything we're trying to set up in ERC4337 is everything that happens underneath here, right? This is the actual, what the user was trying to do, what they were trying to accomplish, the state changes uh, that we are trying to get with this smart account. So great. So that is where we actually handle the operation. And then finally, we have one last call back here, which is going to be sending to the recipient uh, the gas fees here at the end. Now, typically, the bundler specifies itself as the recipient here. So I'm going to label this as the bundler. And I'm pretty sure that that's true. If we pull this up here on chain, we can see, yes, this is in fact the bundler submitting these handle op calls over to the entry point smart contract. All right, great. So that's everything that I wanted to talk about in this closer look of ERC4337. So if we take a look back at our image here, we can understand everything that's happening in this image. Hopefully now we see that the bundler is submitting the transaction. Maybe we can go back a few slides to even see the user in this as well, right? Here we go was the initial image that we took a look at. We have many users sending many user operations. Again, these are the meta transactions that the bundler is going to bundle and then submit on 
chain. Of course, before it puts it actually on chain, it is going to verify each one of those operations by simulating them. Then once it has all the valid user operations, it's going to bundle them up, submit them on chain. Then the entry point is going to go through each of the user operations in a loop, verifying that they are valid transactions, sending them over to the smart account so it can execute what the user is trying to do here, and then uh, make some of the post operation calculations and make sure that is paid back for the gas in the way that the user specified should be done in this particular user operation. So hopefully all of this now feels very familiar. When you go to actually use ERC4337, which I recommend you use the account abstraction toolkit from Alchemy called the account kit, uh, you will be familiar with these concepts. So when you run into some issues or you're trying to set this up yourself, you should feel very familiar with this flow. So it should be a lot easier for you to debug what's happening here. Let us know what you thought of these videos. This wraps up the conceptual part of ERC4337 before we get into some more practical stuff on the account kit.